Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Seeds for Change, a podcast by the Institute for Applied Ecology. My name is Sierra Dawson, and I am your host for the episode today. In today's episode, I have a wonderful chat with Sarah Leka, a restoration ecologist doing incredible work restoring native prairie and oak woodland habitats here in Oregon. As you'll hear, Sarah's passion for her work is just so apparent and so audible in her voice today. It truly is such a gift to have her here at IEE, and we had a great discussion. So, without further ado, here's Sarah Leka. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I'm excited to talk to you. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. For those that might be unfamiliar with you, do you want to introduce yourself? Give us your name, your pronouns, and what your current position at IAE is? Yes. My name is Sarah Aleka. Uh, My pronouns are she, her, and I am a restoration ecologist in the Habitat Restoration Department. First question that I had for you is, do you have a first memory or experience that drew you to the environment or made you want to know more about potential environmental work? Definitely. Uh, When I was a young child, I was probably seven or eight. I was living in Canada and it was winter. So there was snow on the ground. It was perfectly white. And I remember looking out the window and seeing this flash of red sort of flapping around And it was a cardinal, a northern red cardinal, and it was injured. There was something wrong with its wing. And it was hopping around the backyard, and I just had this sudden urge. Like, I couldn't just leave this beautiful thing out there in the snow. And so I went and I got my mom, and I was like, we have to go rescue this bird. (laughs) And she was like, oh, my God, you know, she she didn't, she, she was like, how am I supposed to do this? How are you supposed to capture a bird? Because even when they're injured, they're pretty hard to capture. So she went outside and spent like half the day trying to capture it. And the way she captured it is, um, you know, when you have a house and you have basement windows and the basement windows sort of have like a little kind of um, catch basin where the sort of window pops out of the ground. And so there's kind of like a little hole. And she managed to kind of capture this cardinal into this little hole. And she took it and brought it into the house And we had no idea what to do with it. We took it to a veterinarian. And because it's a wild animal, the veterinarian didn't didn't charge us. And she said that the wing had been scratched. It hadn't been broken. It was just scratched. And so she said, keep it in the garage so it it still doesn't get unaccustomed to the cold. Feed it. And it was there for about a week. And at that point, she said, that'll probably be enough for, for the wing to heal. So we went out into the garage and we opened the little door to the cage and that bird just shot out and oh my flew God. up into the sky. And oh Aww. man, was I hooked to restoration after that. <laughs> yeah, hoped it lived a happy life after that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I always think about that bird. That's so interesting. Um, when I was talking to Tom in my previous episode, we were talking about how sometimes um, early childhood experiences that lead to environmental work is like some kind of outdoor school or like a summer camp and things. And we like shared that thing. So it's cool that for you, it was um, the instance of like a wild a wildlife instance, you know, that really piqued mm-hmm. your interest. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Nice. And I can imagine a red cardinal against white snow was very striking. So I yes. can I can imagine that's a memory that's very poignant, you know? Yes, yes. I've never seen a red cardinal because they're not here in the West. Mm-hmm. But they're beautiful, beautiful birds. And people love them because they're one of the only birds that stay around in the winter. Okay, cool. The next question that I had was kind of just your general academic path. Um, so you know, what you did for your bachelor's degree um, and any higher education and also just tying that to location because you said you grew up in Canada, but now we're here in the U.S. So if you want to talk about any of that, I would love to hear it. Yeah, well, um, the the bird incident definitely uh, led me down this path of wanting to help animals. And so as I was growing up, there were two things that I really wanted to do. One was to be a writer and the other was to be a veterinarian and save more (laughs) birds. (laughs) So I had these sort of twin paths that I carried on through most of my life. And then when it came to time to go to college, I chose to follow the writing path. And so I got an undergraduate degree in writing and in Mm -hmm. English literature. And I love reading books. I'm very passionate about that. Me too. (laughs) But when I graduated, most jobs that you get as a lit major are working in communications or marketing, Mm -hmm. which are great jobs. They pay really well and they're very uh, stable. 
but they also don't really give you that much um, enjoyment, especially not with the natural world. And I always wanted to work with animals and with wildlife and being outdoors. So what I ended up doing was sort of using that love and that passion in the volunteer sense. So I did a lot of volunteering. Um, I was a a veterinary tech. I was a wildlife tech. I became a wildlife rehabilitator and I rehabilitated um, pigeons and birds in my house. It was all goes back all to that, you know, Northern Cardinal. I was going to say, we're really keeping a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, but I never really, those weren't paid jobs. That was all kind of on the side. And it came to this point in my life when I was working in a you know, just your typical office environment, just picture the gray cubicle. Yeah. And I would be working, you know, every day from nine to five. And I had this computer in front of me that had two screens. And on one screen, I would be doing my work. And on the other screen was a live feed from, you know, one of these bird cams of just looking at birds and nature. And, you know, I just kept saying, why am I sitting in this office? looking at this bird cam, like, why don't I just go out there, right? That's really what I want to do. But I couldn't think of any way to do that. You know, it's like I'd already made this path. I'd already made this decision. At that point, I was in my 30s, already had a good job. Everything was really stable. And so I couldn't really see a path forward except as doing it in my free time as a volunteer. So then sort of serendipity happened. I got this job in marketing at Columbia University, and they have this wonderful program where if you work there for a couple of years, you get free tuition so you can take classes. And so that's what I did. I just started taking ecology classes, and I had no idea where that was going to go, but I loved it immediately. As soon as I started taking it, I thought, wow, this is so great. I'm learning about all of the things that I've been thinking about and wanting to do. And it was really interesting because all of this time I'd been so focused on wildlife and helping individual animals. But something you learn through ecology is that really if you want to make change on a big scale, it's not about individual animals. It's about habitat. It's about large ecosystems. Most animals that are endangered or actually most animals that are in trouble – is not because the individuals are having a difficult time. It's because they've lost their habitat. Their habitat no longer exists. It's gone. And we see that so much here in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, where so many of our grassland birds, so many of our prairie plant species, they're gone because we only have 1% of our prairies left. So there's nowhere for them to go. And it's funny, I was talking to our farm manager here at IAE, and we were talking about some of these plants, and there's this real desire to sort of treat them with care, to be like delicate about them. Oh, you know, this is this endangered species. <laughs> we have to be really delicate. Yeah. And I'll just never forget what our farm manager said. She said, they're not endangered because they're delicate. Yeah. They're endangered because they got nowhere to live. Yeah. And that really stuck with me through school. And I realized slowly over four years of studying at Columbia that if I really want to make change, I need to work on the ecosystem level, mm. on the ecosystem scale. Mm -hmm. And that's what really inspired me to follow this different path. And so I started working in habitats at ecosystem level scales in restoration. Mm -hmm. So I worked in um, New York because it's an estuary. So I did estuary restoration because that's what was there. And so I worked with um, oyster reintroductions. New York City used to be called the big oyster because there used to be so many oysters. Makes sense. So the yeah. idea was, yeah. So the idea was if you restore the oysters, you're creating the habitat of the oyster reefs and once you create the reefs, then those species that live on the reefs will come back. Mm -hmm. But also oysters filter water. They're filter feeders. So they will clean the polluted water. So they provide so many ecosystem benefits. So again, it's like if you're s rescuing one fish, that's one thing. But implementing and restoring back an actual ecosystem engineer like an oyster, you are saving thousands of fish and helping hundreds of animals and small little 
plants, wildlife, mussels, seaweed, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So after I graduated, I did some field work. I did all sorts of different types of projects, really just to expand my skill set. And restoration ecology was certainly that feel that I became most drawn to. Because again, instead of restoring or reintroducing one animal or one plant, restoration deals with an entire habitat. Right. So I went back and did my master's of science. And I chose this pro this program because it's it was the only master's of science in restoration ecology that I could find. And I didn't want to just study general ecology. I wanted to study specifically restoration. And my thesis was incredible. It was an amazing opportunity to work at a bog wetland. And bog wetlands are one of the, again, very rare and endangered habitats. But they're so interesting. They're very, very acidic. So not that many species can survive there. Right. So talk about restoring a system to help so many unique animals and plants. So cool. Mm. There's so many carnivorous species that live in bogs because they don't have this opportunity to get nutrients. So they have to get their nutrients from bugs and flies right. and all kinds of things. It was really, really amazing to do that, to do that work. And I just felt privileged to be able to help habitat recover. Nice. Oh my gosh. I heard so much in that response. I'm like, oh my gosh, where did I start? First of all, I want to acknowledge how much ex internal exploration that it takes to be in an established career, you know, be on a path that seems stable and seems like, all right, I have it together. I finally figured out what I'm doing, you know, but to follow the inkling that you had of, but I but I'm not sure that this is what I want to do forever, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. That takes a lot of internal exploration that I feel like not a lot of people are willing to do because it's scary, right? It's scary mm -hmm. to choose a different path from what you've already established for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you uh, describe it as a serendipitous moment where you started taking classes during, through your job, you said, at Columbia. And just I'm super mm -hmm. happy that that worked out for you. Oh my gosh. And like, I'm just, <laughs> I feel like you have been all over the place, like mm -hmm. location wise, um, mm -hmm. like Canada, New York, Oregon, <laughs> DC, all over the place. And also you started with this um, path of wildlife and you made this connection. Your initial inkling with environmental work was this one red bird, right? Yes. And then you started thinking at a systems level where you're like, well, what is impacting that bird or this other yeah. bird, whatever species, you know, that you're focused on. Mm -hmm. What is impacting the species that makes them imperiled? You know, that's a big connection to make, um, yeah. to be able to think at a systems level. So I super appreciate you, you know, bringing up that connection too. It's like yeah. so fascinating. Yeah. Habitats are everything, everything. And that's one thing that's rare about restoration is that we're working with the whole picture, the big picture. It's of course important to look at all those different elements because they all come together as a whole. But as a restoration ecologist, you're the one that gets to put it all together. Yeah, nice. Oh my gosh, kind of I answered the next question that I was gonna ask too. I was gonna say like, for people that um, are curious or like, how would you define the field of restoration ecology? You've kind of already touched on it. So maybe you wanna take it in a, in a way that's like, well, what does a day in your life as a restoration colonist look like, you know, a field-based component, a not field-based component, if there's anything you want to speak to about that? Yeah. So restoration ecology, for those people that don't know, is a relatively new field. Most, most of environmental protection focused for most of history for conservation. That's how we started our national parks. Yeah. We see something beautiful and we say, let's protect this for the next generation. Yeah. And just to be clear, that is still the best and most environmentally sustainable option. It is much easier to protect something that is still great and in great condition than to restore something. Right. However, society has come a long way in realizing the impact that we have. So restoration is really, at its core, a ethical response to human impacts on the environment. We owe 
restoration to these habitats because of all of the negative consequences that we've had. And it's really one of the few active ways that an average person can actually make a difference to the, the environment. For me, restoration was really exciting because it has so many different elements. It's not just one thing. It's not just going out in the field. It's not just being in the office. You really have to think really, really broadly. Yeah. So if you started a new project as a restoration ecologist, after getting funding and speaking to the clients, really the first step is an assessment of the site. That's where everything begins. So what are we looking at? And there's such a broad range of things. Some of the projects, the sites are already incredible. And restoration, the Society for Ecological Restoration uses a five-star system. So it ranks where along the restoration scale is this site. Okay. So a five-star restoration is essentially a site that looks and behaves and functions just as a natural healthy system would. Down to essentially a one, which really none of the original functions of the site, the native plant diversity, the wildlife, none of that exists. So you can really have a broad range. So are you starting from a one? Are you starting from a four? Where are you starting? And then, of course, the second most important question is where do you want to get to? Right. It's just unrealistic to expect that every single place that we want to restore is going to be able to achieve a five-star restoration. Some sites are just, it's almost sad to say, but they're just beyond repair to that level. And that's simply because our impacts are so strong. A really good example of that is wetlands. One of the main elements of a wetland is the hydrology, meaning the water. And if you don't restore that water regime, if you don't restore natural flooding, natural inputs, you're just never going to be able to restore its original or natural function. It's just not possible. But that's not to say there's not still things we can do. We can still improve a place from a one to a two or a two to a three. This is very possible. So that's sort of the, the first steps is seeing and then assessing where you want to get to. Once you've done that, creating a plan, written a plan, then you get into the fun things of actually implementing your plan. <laughs> and this is the field component of restoration. So this can involve a variety of things. The way we look at it is it's like a tool belt. You need to use different tools for different things. Not every site is going to need the same tools, but you need to be able to have access to those. So some of those things are a tractor for mowing or cutting down trees or shrubs, uh, managing invasive species. This is a very big one. You could use many different methods for that. You can use chemical control. You can use mechanical control, all sorts of different things. And then, of course, the seeding and the planting. So all of that is part of that field component. And that can take a really long time. Sometimes systems really need a lot of help to get to that. And sometimes we're working on projects for, you know, three, five, 10 years. But people are sometimes surprised to find that, honestly, you can get change in a very little amount of time as well. Because a lot of these systems, they need some kind of disturbance. Now, natural systems, they're looking for change. That's what they do. There's floods, there's fires, there's gopher activity that churns up plants and kills them. There's deer that browse them. So having all that disturbance is a good thing. And as a restoration ecologist, part of your job is to cause disturbance to create change. I love that restoration ecology reframes the idea of disturbance to be a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that's something that obviously, um, if, if you've ever worked in environmental fields, you know that we are very averse to disturbance, typically. Yes. Um, that is why, for example, here in the Willamette Valley, so much of our ecosystems are altered because we don't like we don't let fire into our systems anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing um, mm -hmm. for prairie work that we do here at the Institute for Applied Ecology. So mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that not only is restoration ecology a relatively new field, because I was talking about this too with Tom, we were talking about how 
in during his um graduate path uh restoration ecology became a thing so it was yeah. a thing while he like you know while he was going through his schooling so not only is it a new field um but it's also a field that is dynamic and kind of challenges the status quo or what we typically think of when we think of like preserving environments you know so i really love that this yeah. field is unique in that way Definitely. And pushing the status quo, I think, is really an important element of restoration. Because it's still relatively new, a lot of the things that we want to do, we don't really have established research on. We don't have questions that have been answered for a lot of these things. So a lot of restoration is experimentation, Yeah, trying to see what works and what doesn't. I can kind of see parallels and also divergence from the field of restoration ecology versus like even conservation research, which are two programs that we have at IEE. So I'm speaking very broadly yes. of our organization, whereas IEE is very, or conservation research at IEE is very focused on like this individual species that we mm -hmm. are trying to assess, you know, how do we preserve the species in, in the most natural like framework that you set up where that's kind of how we think of um, environmental work is how do we preserve, yes. you know? Um, yes. And that and that is an element of restoration ecology, but it's also more emphasis on the broader scale of a systems mm -hmm. level approach than Definitely. conservation research might be. So mm -hmm. I like that I am seeing these like differences and alignments and it's all comes together to create a bigger picture. Definitely. Yes, you're absolutely right. I specifically wanted to spend some time today talking about your work with the Plants for People project, because oh, yeah. I think that is an amazing project and I would love to hear more about it. Um, I want to spotlight it. So I just want to hear what is the Plants for People project to you and why is it important? Because it's a com it's a um, collaboration between IAE and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Run. So if you want to speak to that. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm really proud to be part of this project. I'm only a very small piece of this project. I started at IE two years ago and I was given this project. However, this project had already been going on at that point for eight years, run by Peter Moore, our previous ecologist. So I'm really just one small steward of this really amazing project. And it has been funded very generously by OWEB for all of those years. And the project's main goal is to restore culturally significant species back to the Willamette Valley, primarily for the use by indigenous people. So IAE works with the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde to highlight, find, and restore populations of culturally significant species. And we do this in a broad array of ways. One is habitat restoration. Meaning, again, back to what we were saying before, if we need culturally significant species on the landscape, they need to have a home. Mm -hmm. Number one, we need to create a house for them. So the project involves, again, manually managing many of these sites, mowing, burning, um, using herbicide in limited uses, um, hand weeding, all sorts of things to, again, restore these properties so that there's somewhere for these plants to be. The second big element is creating and growing these actual plants. So a lot of our native species, and I'm sure we'll talk about this um, probably in future podcasts, I'm mm -hmm. sure you'll talk about this, but we have a real dearth of native seed. We really, really need native plants. And restoration could not happen without plant materials because that's always that element of we need to restore back what has been lost. And for culturally significant species, this is particularly true. Uh, and the reason why is because a lot of these species are bulbs and roots. So this is something like a camas, which has a bulb, or um, yampa, which is a, a, another native species that was used for, um, for harvesting. And they're expensive to produce. And sometimes these native species are also difficult to produce. And finally, there's not always a demand for these species. They're not particularly showy all mm -hmm. of the time, which means that there's not really a gardening or commercial demand for them. So nurseries don't produce them. So for the Plants for People project, the Confederate Tribes of Grand Ronde created a nursery on their property to create and grow these plants 
and it has been incredibly, incredibly successful. Uh, Jeremy Oya, who is the native plant coordinator there, he uh, manages the entire nursery and grows thousands and thousands of um, bulbs, seeds, and not only shares them with the tribe, but then also uses them for this Plants for People project to bring them back into the landscape. So that's that second element. And then there's a third element, which is creating opportunities for Indigenous people to actually gather the material. So you might think, well, why is it hard to gather? You can just go anywhere and pick some plants. There are a lot of hurdles in the face of Indigenous harvesting. One is access. So a lot of places that you would think would be able to, you know, allow for getting these native plants are on private land. And so someone would have to, a, a tribal member would have to ask for permission to go there. Other sites are have been uh, using herbicide or other chemicals, which makes them not suitable for eating. Because obviously a lot of these um not only edible foods, but also uh, materials that are used for crafting are actually placed in the mouth or using, um, you know, your hands to create basketry. And all of that could be means of getting being exposed to herbicides yeah. and pesticides. So that's another limitation. And then finally, just not having enough of a density mm -hmm. of these species Right. So fine, maybe you have a site that doesn't use herbicides or pesticides, is, you know, readily accessible. There is no access issues. But then there just really isn't enough of them. Right. Right. If there's only five plants, that's not enough to sustain a harvest. Right. In order to harvest something, you need to have a large enough density. Yeah. So the final part of this project is really creating these harvest areas and really thinking through logistically of where can they be that are easy to access. Where do they not have to have special permitting? And where can we create enough of a density that people can go regularly and this can become a regular area for harvesting? I love that project because it is a collaboration between like our nonprofit and um, the Confederated Tribes. So we're bringing indigenous people into the process of what restoration is and what the work we're doing. And they're very, very tightly linked, you know, in that way. Um, and I love that this project also emphasizes species that are culturally significant but may not have the demand, as you were mentioning, um, because yeah. most of the time, um, plant materials, and we'll hear from our plant materials program soon as well, um, but plant materials is really driven by what do people want, you know? Yeah. And so if there's not that demand there, it's very easy for those species that are culturally significant to just fall by the wayside and nobody's really That's paying right. attention to them. So. I really right. wanted to highlight this project because I think it is so integral to not only cultivating and maintaining this connection between our nonprofit and the indigenous people that are also stewards of the land in the Willamette Valley, but also just like keeping those species around, you know, so. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, I think it's really important. We need to listen mm -hmm. to our indigenous folks. We need to listen to what they're saying. They have been managing this land for much, much, much longer than any of the rest of us. And their worldview is very unique in that, and of course, I'm not going to speak for Indigenous people. You know, you could have, you can certainly invite the Confederate Tribes of Grand Ronde to this podcast. I'm sure they would be happy to talk about it. Um, but they certainly have a, have a different point of view of that landscapes require people and need people on them to manage them and to maintain them. And that is very different from the traditional Western point of view, where we see wild places as untouched landscapes. All right. I just wanted to end the main part of the interview with giving you opportunity to highlight any other projects that you're working on that you're excited about. Oh, I could talk about my projects forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, one that I definitely want to talk about and highlight are the projects with private landowners. Private landowners are so key to the restoration picture. So many times we're talking about federal lands, federal lands, public lands, parks, state parks. That's only a very small portion of the land in the United States. So much of it is owned by private landowners. And their commitment to conservation is what can really make a difference for the habitat and for species. 
Mm-hmm. So I have several, I work with several private landowners in Corvallis and the surrounding area, at, at, particularly for the Kincaid's Lupin Recovery Project. And what I love about this project is that it's really looking at connectivity and how for a species to do well, you really need to have multiple populations interacting on different scales. That's the way we protect on a long term is creating multiple homes for someone. So if just one house disappears, they have other places to go. So the way that we do that is working with these private landowners who have amazing properties and are willing to help us come to their properties and help them enhance their sites. So we seed, we provide um, seed for these threatened and endangered species. Uh, We help manage invasive species. Uh, We work with them really to uh, implement a lot of restoration practices that can include prescribed fire, that can include um, mowing or other mechanical means, really anything that's required on the site. And I just want to shout out to anyone who, you know, has private land and is interested and is inspired by hearing restoration, really think about what even a small portion of your property could be set aside as a home for some animals or plants that, you know, are looking for one. So that's one project that I'm really passionate about. Um, Another one that I wanted to talk about was um, prairie oak. So the Willamette Valley is has many endangered habitat types, and one of them are is uh, oak woodlands and oak savannas. So historically, we used to have these sort of large open prairies with these large open grown oaks. And Oregon white oak is a species that doesn't like to be shaded out. So this is not a species you're going to find growing in a thick conifer forest. It really needs sunlight and open spaces. And by restricting prairies and open spaces and allowing conifers to grow out, many of these oak habitats are lost. The oaks die when they're shaded out. So we work with a lot of different um, properties with the BLM, but also with the city of Corvallis to restore these oak habitats. And they're really, truly amazing. Oregon white oaks can live you know, 500 years. They're large, enormous species. And you know, earlier when I was talking about how I was restoring these oyster beds as really important elements of a habitat, that's exactly what Oregon white oak is here. They provide so many amazing benefits to our ecosystem. So providing acorns for all sorts of animals, including the acorn woodpecker who takes those little acorns and stashes them away, <laughs> you know, for later, which is so crazy. Um But also the dead snags also act as, you know, habitat for many different forms of wildlife. So doing work on these white oaks is really, really rewarding as well. And again, if you have a property with a really big Oregon white oak, that tree could be hundreds and hundreds of years old. All right, so we're going to end off this interview with a couple of lightning round questions. Yeah. The intention is for you to answer them as quickly as possible, so try not to think too hard. (laughs) All right, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, number one, what is a fun fact about you that you want more people to know? Um, Well, I've traveled all around the world, and I've traveled to six continents. So hopefully trying to get to the seventh one, Antarctica, soon. Oh, my gosh. This is what I said where I was like, I feel like you've been everywhere (laughs) geographically. I'm literally right. (laughs) It is true. I do love to travel. I love it. Oh, my gosh. Seeing new landscapes. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Okay. Maybe a hard question. What is your favorite site that you work at and why? Oh, that's not a hard question at all. It's very okay. easy. <laughs> uh, I have this private landowner that I work with actually in Corvallis. And the reason why it's the the most exciting project is because the property has so much untapped potential. And for a restoration ecologist, that is the most exciting thing to see. To come to a site, for example, like her property that has wetlands, that has wet prairie, that has upland prairie, that has oak savanna, oak woodland, all of these amazing things just on one property alone. It's just so exciting for someone like me to try to restore these really rare and exciting 
exciting habitats. Nice. Okay. Um, what is the weirdest job you've ever had? Weirdest job? Uh, yeah, I have to say that rehabilitating the pigeons was probably the weirdest <laughs> job. In what sense? Why is that weird? So I would, we would have these injured birds that would come in. And because pigeons are a non-native species, you don't need a federal or state permit to bring them home to rehabilitate them. Technically, according to the government, they're an invasive species or a non-native species. It doesn't really matter what you do to them. Uh -huh. But of course, when you bring an animal home, you have to take care of it all the time. Okay. So, you know, we would have people over on the weekend, you know, hanging out, listening to music. And I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. I have to go and change the bandages on an injured <laughs> pigeon in my bathroom. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> okay i like that though yeah i can see that being weird it's weird but wonderful is how i think oh I would yeah it. <laughs> i think for people like us who are environmentalists and love yeah. wildlife and love nature it sounds amazing but most people were horrified that i had rats with wings <laughs> in my home <laughs> oh my god okay fun <laughs> oh that's so great <laughs> what is a species you wish to work with even if you don't right now Oh, I would love to work more with amphibian species, particularly red-legged frog. So when I did my master's work in um, BC in Canada, I worked, as I said, in a bog. And bogs very I don't have that much amphibian life because I said it's very acidic. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really get to work with them. But I learned a lot about this species, which I thought was really just a beautiful, interesting interesting amphibian. Uh, they actually have their sort of woodland slash wetland species, which is really interesting. And they need a certain kind of habitat where they have access to water. They also need access to wooded forested areas. And that's just really interesting and unique to me. So I would love to work on habitats to help that species. All right, cool. Amphibian work. All right. And um, my last one, last lightning round question is my very typical in 60 seconds or less, if you can manage, what is your best advice for somebody that is wanting to become a restoration ecologist? That's a good question. And there's so many things I would say. But I think the, I think the best advice I could give is before you make any kind of decisions about what you want to do with your life or with anything, really, is go out and try it. Go get out and volunteer. Come to our IAE events. We run so many events in the restoration department because you always need help. You know, planting, you know, stacking wood, all kinds of things. And see what you think about it because that will really give you a sense of, number one, how much physical work is required because there is that physical element to it. And two, how much how much are you interested in disturbing sites? I work with a lot of people who are really interested in the environment. They're interested in conservation. They're not particularly interested in the disturbance and the upset that restoration specifically causes. It can be quite destructive. Fire is a really big one. We burn landscapes. There's nothing left. It's just charred. And that's really important. But a lot of people don't really feel comfortable with that. So try it out first before you kind of make any decisions. And, you know, when you see what it's like, I think you can get really hooked on the amazing change that a person can do in restoration. All right. Good advice. I like it. Okay. That's the end of my questions for you. I have enjoyed talking to you so much today, Sarah. Thank you so much for sitting Absolutely. down with us and sharing your Absolutely. infinite wisdom, it seems like. I feel like this <laughs> podcast could keep going, but I will leave it there for now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode and learning more about Sarah's work. As she said, the Habitat Restoration Program at IEE runs volunteer events very frequently. So if you live in the Willamette Valley and you want to get involved, you can learn more on our website, appliedeco.org, or follow us on Instagram at applied underscore ecology. 
Up next, Seeds for Change is taking you on a trip 1,300 miles south to Santa Fe, New Mexico. We will hear from Melanie Giesler, the director of the Southwest Branch of IAE. And if you're up for a trip, be sure to stick around and we'll meet back here next month. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.